Normally, I use this channel to talk about people like anti-vaxxers, but this week I decided to make an extra video because I heard some concerning statements coming from an actual doctor who is on the front lines of fighting this COVID-19 pandemic. I have enormous respect for doctors and healthcare workers, especially now, but having a degree does not give you a free pass to spread misinformation. And so, here we are. I'm talking about Dr. Daniel Erickson, who is a doctor of osteopathic medicine out in Bakersfield, California. Recently, he and a colleague gave a press briefing about COVID-19, where he made some really, really dubious claims. So let's take a listen. No, I'm saying you, you have to give the virus time. In, from December to now, there was tons of hypotheses. You have to let the data work. Let the, let the virus rise up. Then we study it and we see, did we respond appropriately? Initially, the response, fine, shut it down. But as the data comes across and we say, now, wait a second, we've never, ever responded like this in the history of the country. Why are we doing this now? Well, our response is unprecedented because this virus is unprecedented. It's the first time that the modern world has seen a brand new virus that has gone pandemic on this scale. As you guys know, the initial models were, were woefully inaccurate. They predicted millions of cases of death, not of, not of prevalence or incidence, but death. That is not materializing. And some of them were, were based on social distancing and still predicted hundreds of thousands of deaths, which has been inaccurate. Well, models are kind of meant to be wrong. They're meant to adapt and change as we gather new data. So it's not really a surprise that the earliest models with the least information are turning out to not be accurate. But remember that we're just in the middle of this. At least in the US, cases have only been rising for really the past about two months. So we really aren't sure how many people are going to end up dying from this. But as of filming this on May 1st, about 60,000 people have died in the US. And worldwide, that number is about 235,000. That's only expected to grow as the year goes on. What is materializing in the state of California is 12% positives. Well, if we, we have 39.5 million people. If we just take a basic calculation and extrapolate that out, that equates to about 4.7 million cases throughout the state of California, which means this thing is widespread. That's the good news. We've seen 1,227 deaths in the state of California with a possible uh, incidence or prevalence of 4.7 million. That means you have a 0.03 chance of dying from COVID-19 in the state of California. That is extremely irresponsible for a doctor to say with confidence at a press briefing like this. Just because you have 12% of all the patients that you're testing turning out positive does not mean you can extrapolate that number to the entire population of California and expect that to be accurate. You were just criticizing early models for not being accurate. Your extrapolation is extremely inaccurate. The actual death rate of this virus is likely something we won't know for a while. We need more data and more time. So at a time like this, to extrapolate and make this weird assumption in order to come up with a very small number, in order to apparently downplay the dangers of this virus, is just irresponsible. That would be like me saying that in a span of about two months, 64,000 Americans died from COVID-19. If we extrapolate that out to the end of the year, then we'll have about 360,000 deaths from COVID-19 in America. That's not true. Hopefully it's not true. And it would be wildly inaccurate and irresponsible of me to say that that is a real statistic. Right now, worldwide COVID-19 death rates range from 0.08% all the way up to about 15%. And those rates vary for a variety of reasons, but we won't really know the actual number until we have more time. Our best estimates though, is that it will fall somewhere between one and 2%. And as we move through this data, what I want you to see is millions of cases, small amount of death. Those millions of cases you're talking about aren't real. They're extrapolated. It's not real data that he's talking about. The reason I'm making that point is because we're going to compare this to flu and say, is this significantly different from influenza A and B? And if not, why has our response been what it is? We always have between 37 and 60,000 deaths in the United States every single year. No pandemic talk, no shelter in place, 
No shutting down of businesses, no sending doctors home. That's from the flu, by the way, just to clarify. It's really confusing to me why a doctor is saying this. We are obviously having a different response to COVID-19 as opposed to flu, because for flu, we have vaccines, we have treatments, our healthcare system is used to dealing with it every single year. For COVID-19, we have no vaccine, we have no treatment, and it's a brand new virus that is putting a huge strain on the healthcare system. Now I want to compare flu virus. Is this significantly different? And I just got a little bit of data here. Um, so deaths uh, per the CDC, 24,000 to 62,000 deaths each year. Um, we get about, we had uh, about 45 million total cases in 2017 with about 62,000 deaths or a 0 0.13 chance of death from flu in the United States. As you know, our other numbers were 0 0.02. No, they weren't and they will not be. So the lethality of, of COVID-19 is much less. We have both been in the ER through swine flu and through bird flu. Did we shut down for those? Were, were they much less dangerous than COVID? Is the flu less dangerous than COVID? Let's look at the death rates. No, it's not. They're similar in prevalence and in death rate. So we are saying that our response now, now that we know the facts, it's time to get back to work. It's time to test people. This is honestly one of the strangest things that I've heard him say all press conference. As of now, on May 1st, about 64,000 Americans have lost their lives due to COVID-19. That's already more than an average flu season. And I really don't understand why he is comparing these COVID-19 deaths, which have happened all in the span of just under two months, to the number of flu deaths that occur over an entire season. It just doesn't make any sense. And then when you, when you bring up a system of lockdown, you automatically have to compare it to a system of no lockdown, Sweden and Norway. I'm, I'm Norwegian. Norway has lockdown. Norway has lockdown. Sweden does not have lockdown. What happened in those two countries? Are they vastly different? Did Sweden have a massive outbreak of cases? Did Norway have nothing? Let's look at the numbers. Sweden. Sweden has 15,322 cases of COVID. Uh, they, have, they did 74,600 tests, which is 21%, similar to the other countries, 21% of all those tested came out positive for COVID. What's the population of Sweden? About 10.4 million. Uh, so if we extrapolate out the data, about 2 million cases of COVID in Sweden. They did a little bit of social distancing, they would wear masks and separate. They went to schools, stores were open. They were almost about their normal daily life with a little bit of social distancing. They had how many deaths? 1,765. California's had 1,220 with isolation. No isolation, 1,765. We have more people. What I'm getting at is millions of cases, very small death. Norway. It's next door neighbor. This is where I come from. These are two Scandinavian nations. We can compare them as they are similar. Let's look at the data. Norway, 7,191 cases of COVID. Total COVID tests, 145,279. So they came up with 4.9% of all COVID tests were positive in Norway. Population of Norway, 5.4 million. So if we extrapolate the data as we've been doing, which is the best we can do at this point, they have about 1.3 million cases. Now, their deaths as a total number were 182, fairly small, but statistically insignificant from 1,700, you realize. Millions of cases, small amount of deaths. 1,700, 100, these are statistically insignificant. He really needs to stop with this extrapolation nonsense. It is not the best we can do at this point. The best we can do is look at the hard data. And when we look at the hard data that we have right now, we see that social distancing does seem to have a huge impact. As of filming this video, Sweden has 20,302 cases with 2,462 deaths, putting their actual death rate at about 12.13%. On the other hand, Norway, as of now, has 7,710 cases and 207 deaths, 
with an actual death rate of 2.68%. I don't know why he is saying that this is statistically insignificant, especially at a time where data is constantly flowing in and things are always changing. It is impossible to make definitive statements about this, but as of now, it seems social distancing is having a real effect. At least it seems to in the example that he specifically gave. When you're a little child crawling on the ground, putting stuff in your mouth, viruses and bacteria come in, you form an antigen antibody complex, you form IgG, IgM. This is how your immune system is built. You don't take a small child, put them in bubble wrap in a room and say, go have a healthy immune system. This is immunology, microbiology 101. What I'm seeing is when you take human beings and you say, go into your house, clean all your counters, Lysol them down. You're going to kill 99% of viruses and bacteria. Wear a mask, don't go outside. What does that do to our immune system? Our immune system is used to touching. We share bacteria, staphylococcal, streptococcal bacteria, viruses. We develop an immune response daily to this stuff. When you take that away from me, my immune system drops. As I shelter in place, my immune system drops. You keep me there for months, it drops more. And now I'm at home hand washing vigorously, washing the counters, worried about things that are indeed what I need to survive. It is true that our immune systems develop an immunity by encountering new antigens from a virus or a bacteria, and then remembering those antigens so that we can fight off those pathogens later. Usually, that memory lasts for a long, long time. There is no evidence that sheltering in place and social distancing for a short amount of time is going to significantly affect your immune system in any negative way. And in the meantime, our immune systems are still constantly being encountered by thousands and thousands of viruses and bacteria every single day. What he is saying has no biological basis, and there is no reason to be medically concerned that we are going to see a huge spike in other diseases if we all suddenly come out of social distancing. What we do have to worry about are hundreds of thousands more cases of COVID-19, which will lead to many, many more deaths. You think people are worrying too much? Of course they are, but that's, that's from media telling them to. So should people panic about COVID-19? No, we shouldn't panic, but we should take it seriously and we should care. This is a very unprecedented virus and we are taking very unprecedented measures in order to mitigate its spread and the overall death that it causes. We're likely to be making mistakes during this time. We will likely look back and say exactly what we should have done differently. But right now, it is really hard to do that when misinformation like this runs rampant. Right now, we don't have all the data. We're not even close. And so taking the data that we do have and manipulating it in ways that make no statistical or scientific sense in order to make these really strong statements that seem to downplay the severity of this virus is extremely irresponsible. And I'm really disappointed to see someone in the medical field doing this. So if you're frustrated on where to get accurate information on COVID-19, my answer is not to listen to the mainstream media, but to listen to scientists and doctors. And when I say that, I mean multiple. Don't just listen to one scientist. Don't just listen to one doctor. Try and learn from the entire community. That's the best way you're going to get your information. I will leave the links to some of my favorite science sources in the description. And for now, that's going to do it. I'll see you next time.